Hi, I'm Sean Kleefeld, author of Comic Studies series Web Comics, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a first-time guest. This is this is uh, amazing for Two Geeks Talking because we've had two first-time guests back-to-back, which is very rare in my case. I usually ask people that I've interviewed like 10 years ago type deal to come back on. But he is an, uh, he is an author. He is a writer. He has been in web comics as long, if not longer, than I have when it comes to writing about comics in general, which is amazing in its own right. So this is a true history of web comics that we're going to speak with today. A historian, I should say. He is, of course, Sean Kleefeld. How are you doing today, Sean? One thing I did not mention, and I have to congratulate you on, is congratulations on being nominated for an Eisner Award. That's an amazing accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled. Absolutely thrilled. Um, I, I've heard before, you know, people talking about various other awards saying, uh, you know, it's, a, an, it's an honor just to be nominated. And, and I really get that now, you know, uh, um, putting putting my name alongside some of those other folks, uh, Charles and, and Neil and Bart and and Rebecca uh, and everybody is is just absolutely phenomenal. I'm I'm very 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 honored to be part of that. I remember reading uh, something about one of your articles you posted, and I think this was in regards to your Eisner nomination and the fact that you use the Eisners as a litmus test for your own knowledge of terms of comics. Does that still hold true now that you're in nominated yeah. as well? Um, not as much as it used to. Um, but yeah, as uh, back when they when they first started, and I was still uh, pretty new to comics, generally speaking, yeah, it was it was definitely a bellwether of uh, how much do I actually know and, and how much am I learning. Um, but at this point, I think it was maybe about four or five years ago, um, I started seeing names on on the Eisner list of people who was I, I was actually friends with, you know, and it was like. And it's not just a matter of uh, do I recognize this book or do I rec- have I read this book or anything. It's uh, how many people do I actually already know and how many people am I friends with and, and that kind of thing. Um, and when I got to that point, I was like, yeah, it's not really a good measurement tool <laughs> along those lines anymore. It's still great to see my friends and colleagues and whatever nominated. Uh, but yeah, it's it's hard to, to put that measure on things anymore when it's I've kind of got that more personal investment now. It's it's amazing because the comic industry is, is a huge industry in itself. And specifically the niche of web comics has has been something of a breakout over the last 20, 30 years. Because realistically that's how this show got started. We got started interviewing web comic creators. And to have a person like a Phil Folio who we just spoke of earlier in the green room um, you know, he's an idol in terms of not only comic creation, but such a wonderful person to begin with, and his wife as well, Gajra. Looking at these legends, putting together this book, what was the first thing that you thought of when you were going, that was going through your mind when you were trying to put together this book? Like, web comics is a huge topic. How did you narrow it down? Um... <laughs> I'm not really sure, honestly. It was, um, yeah, it's um, one of the, that was actually the probably the biggest challenge of, of writing the book is just, just trying to condense everything of the past, you know, 20 or 30 years into uh, a single book, uh, particularly when there's been so little written about it elsewhere. Um, you know, so one of the, it, it was, one of the challenges there was uh, trying to figure out where to even start, right? Because, I mean, I, to be to be candid with with what's out there currently, no one's really even defined what web comics even are, right? You say, oh, well, it's comics on the web, but okay, but does that include what's on Comicsology, or does that include Garfield, which you know is posted online every day, or? Or you know, Blondie, or Beetle Bailey, or you know, any any of those kind of comics. Do those qualify? 
Uh, and if not, why not? And, you know, what about, um, you know, Action Comics or Spider-Man or whatever? Those are using the internet to be sent back and forth from the penciler to the inker to the colorist to the letterer to the print house. Uh, you know, that's all being done online as well. Does that qualify? Um, so that ended up being kind of my starting point is, you know, what am I even talking about here conceptually, right? Um, and that's a large part of my introduction in the book is, you know, just defining what is and what isn't comics, at least as far as what I can work with and what I can talk about here, because, um, you know, it's just so wide open a topic. You know, I had to put parameters <laughs> around it basically to to even start, and that kind of seemed like the the best way to do that is let's let's define this stuff up front first and foremost. Because um, I mean, I'm honest, I I don't want I don't want to sound too egotistical about this, and I really don't mean it like that. But it did feel a little bit like writing the introduction to Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, mm -hmm. right? Is He's, you know, I know web comics when I see it, but how do you define that? And I think Scott McCloud had the same issue writing Understanding Comics was he's trying to define comics and everybody knows what comics are, except there's no real, real definition. I know comics when I see it, but, you know, does, does Family Circus count as a comic? Because it's only one panel. Uh, do ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs count? Do ancient cave paintings count? All of that kind of stuff. Um, so there's that kind of discussion that you kind of have to have first on what are we even talking about here? Um, and that, that's kind of where I started with things and like, okay, well, I really have to go back to very basics and set a lot of ground level work to even get where we're supposed to be discussing the, uh, the in the first place. To be perfectly fair, you had, you have thousands of web comics to choose from when you when you in terms of starting but realistically you chose six to at least base this book off of at least based off of marketing slash monetization of of their properties from what i can tell mm -hmm. um phil folio being one of yeah. them but who were the six that you you ultimately chose as you know the highlight of this book well yeah that was actually that was a hard question to to kind of nail down too is um the, the publisher did want me to focus in on, like you say, the, 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 just a handful of, of specific comics um, in particular to look at. Um, and, you know, with the hundreds and thousands of comics that are out there, what do you, what do you start with? Um, and what I had to, one of the challenges I had to weigh is, uh, A, I, I wanted to pick a variety of different things, right? You don't want to grab a bunch of the same ones. Um, and you also want to make sure that you get uh, a variety of types of people, the types of comics. Um, but at the same time, you want to try and get stuff that's, and, and part of that variety is new versus old comics. But then at the same time, you don't want to grab anything too new because book publishing is, you know, certainly relative to the, the internet, notoriously slow. Mm -hmm. So you want to make some sure that whatever you pick to go in the book, is still active and relevant when the book is actually published. So that's the, you know, that was one of the, one of the criteria too, is, you know, I've kind of got to pick something that seems like it's fairly stable and will probably be around at least until the book is published kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you end up with uh, stuff like questionable content. Uh, what else is in there? Uh, dumbing of age, um, girl genius, uh, you know, Phil and Kay's uh, book there, uh, webcomic. Um, some of those kind of more old guard type of, uh, of web comics that have been around a little while and don't, you know, they've been successful enough. There's, there doesn't seem to be any chance of them going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and then some of the newer ones, um, what else do I have in here? Uh, uh, do -do -do. I, that's it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Penny Arcade seemed Honestly, I didn't, I wasn't, I was a little skeptical on including Penny Arcade as well. Just, uh, again, as it is an older comic and, and one that everybody kind of goes to because it's been around so long, but they have such a unique situation and setup. Um, I felt kind of mandatory to include them. <laughs> so, 
Um, you know, it's they they they've got they've got a story that is unfailingly unique mm-hmm. in, in web comics. You know, and that's I, I've heard any number of, of web comic artists and creators over the years. You know, kind of wishing for that kind of break that they had, um, which you know frankly has not happened before or since so um that that kind of unique uh perspective i think they the warrants their inclusion here but yeah to your to your point earlier that was another thing is making sure that um i do have a variety of uh different types of things in terms of their marketing in terms of their monetization and, and whatever um and that's why that's a good ex- good reason why i've got both dumbing of age and questionable content in there is they both have kind of a similar setup and format and style of humor and style of storytelling, um, but they approach the the marketing and the monetization aspect very very differently. Um, so yeah, there's there's a little bit. I've tried to get a little bit of everything. I don't know that I've gotten as full of a range as I would have liked, um, but uh, but yeah, I, I was generally pleased with. Uh, the broad scope of, of what I've picked out and why people are the types of stories people are doing, the types of comics that they're doing and, and trying to use that as a microcosm of here's some of the options that are out there of the millions and millions <laughs> that are available. When I first started reading web comics, and I'm sure you have a similar story, but how I got started was a friend of mine, Phil Phil from he goes do you like reading web comics and we were playing wow at the time this is how old I am <laughs> so do you like reading web comics I said yeah sure they're they're awesome I, I've only read a couple though he goes well here let me give you the list the list was 4,000 web comics that he had gathered URLs from and put it into a, a bookmark that HTML file and he gave it to me and I used that for for almost a decade until a lot of it started getting you know hiatus and retired and all this other stuff Sure. And it, it, if it wasn't for that list, I don't think I would do this show. I don't think I'd be interviewing webcomic creators. I don't think I'd be talking to you about the history of webcomics because that took me to a place where, uh, from a creative perspective, it was like, these people are amazing. Why aren't more people looking at their work? Why aren't more people looking at webcomics? If you talk to nowadays yeah. I think they would say yes uh, you know I know web comics I know this one this one this one and I read this religiously but the average person doesn't know about web yeah. comics how does your book translate to the average person well that that goes back to um, part of how I defined web comics in the first place is you know I, I think it's there's a lot of people you think of your, you know, your Penny Arcades, your PVPs, your Girl Geniuses, you know, those, a lot of old school staples of web comics. And that's, if, if somebody does know web comics, that's what they tend to think of. Um, and if they don't know web comics, if they don't think of themselves as web comic readers, um, then they'll have no clue of any of those. They'll never heard of them any of those and they're like, well, I just, I don't even read comics kind of thing. Um, but as I was kind of doing research and kind of looking at defining web comics, um, one of the things that I found that was interesting is that really, honestly, everybody is reading web comics, whether they know it or not. Well, if you're, if you're online, I should say, qualify that you do need to be online but as long as you're online you're, you're just, there's a very good chance that you're reading web comics and you might not even know it um, because a lot of memes that are out there are in a comic format and they don't seem like it because they're using frequently using still clips from movies or TV shows or, or what have you and you recognize that as okay. Here's uh, you know Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford from Star Wars, and you know they're having uh, somebody's put together some kind of like comedic banter uh, among the three of them, and you kind of know the characters, and even and you know there's a joke at the end of it. Uh, you know there was there was one going around when the latest round of Star Wars movies came out of 
you know, uh, Harrison Ford wondering whether or not, you know, he even wears, is, am I supposed to wear a hat in this movie or not? Or is, <laughs> where's that the, was that the other franchise? I can't remember. Right. And it's kind of those kind of conversation yeah. and the jokes, you know, you can, you can judge their quality in and of themselves, but the format of them, even though they're using still images from movies and from TV shows, that's the sequential art format, right? You're using, uh, right. There's the, um, you know, uh, Fumetti is all about using photographs to create comics, right? It's the same idea. You're using still shots from these movies, uh, from these TV shows to create comics. And so those show up in, you know, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Tumblr, all, you know, whatever social media platform you happen to be on. And they're not as, uh, they're not treated as web comics are not usually thought of as web comics because they don't have a homepage. They don't have, um, frequently they don't even have a creator tag to them necessarily. It's just a meme, right? So one guy created it and, and it started floating around on various social media platforms. And there's, it's hosted in his, uh, you know, like I said, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Um, and all of that stuff is still a form of web comics, right? They're still comics. They're still posted on the web. They're still shared on the web. They're sent around. People are enjoying them uh, to whatever degree. Um, and that's that's part of web comics, right? And they, you don't really think about those, I don't think, in terms of, uh, of web comics, right? They don't have that homepage like, you know, girlgenius.net or pvponline.com or, or anything like that. Um, they don't have that homepage. They're not served up through uh, Webtoons or, or one of those platforms like that. Uh, they're just floating around it kind of independent. They don't have that long form sequential narrative, but they're still web comics. They're still comics. They're still de delivered on the web and everybody's seeing those and everybody knows how to read them and knows how to appreciate them, even if they're done crudely, right? You, even if they're, they're bad screenshots, they're out of focus. There's bad MS Paint job on top of it to edit out, uh, uh, you know, some detail in the background, uh, and that bad MS Paint jobs to rechange the captions in a lot of cases. <laughs> um, that's all comics. Um, and so even if so, if somebody comes to me and says I don't read web comics, my counter argument is yes, you do. You know, you don't know it, but you are reading comics. Uh, there, all this stuff that's showing up on social media. You might just call it a meme, but it's a web comic. Obviously, putting together a book like this took a lot of time. I mean, how many years did it take you, or months, or whatever? Did it take you to, to finally gather all of this academic knowledge and put it into this amazing book? Um, well, there's there's two answers to that. One is. 20 some years <laughs> is, you know, a, a lot of this is, is kind of stuff that's uh, been filtering around in my head in various forms uh, since I began reading web comics, uh, like I said, like 20 ish years ago. Um, formally speaking, I think it was, um, I think I spent probably about not quite a year um, as like something in the, nine or 10 month range of actually sitting down and doing the actual writing. Uh, another maybe three months of going back and forth on, on editing and, and streamlining things, something like that. Um, probably, yeah, about a year from when I sat down and actually started typing to uh, when my editor came back and said, yep, I think we're good to go to press. Obviously with a book this size and the limitation of the web comics, you could include or maybe were forced to include what did you have to cut out that you really wished you could have kept in there is so much holy cow um i think a big thing is uh, w well in the first place i've only got to your point earlier there's really only six major examples that i kind of focus on in the book um i would have loved to have done you know 10 or 12 or 15 or something like that and gotten a broader range um i would have liked to have done a lot more in terms of the creation process. Um, 
the, like the actual, you know, how people are actually sitting down and, you know, writing scripts and drawing the individual panels. And um, I think there's a, there's a whole lot going on there. I touch on it in several places, um, you know, uh, talking about, how you know I've, I've got a section in there how unusual it is that phil folio for example uh, is still drawing it by hand and on pencil and paper um and i've got another bit i uh, i've got in there of um i forget which artist it was but one of the artists who was drawing on a wacom tablet and it died in the middle of you know you know 300 pages into their 600 800 page story or something um, so then she has to scramble for trying to get a new one and get that up and running and, you know, that, that whole business. Um, I, I touch on that in the book, but there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot more that you can get into on that. Um, the actual uploading of comics mm -hmm. don't even, I barely, I think I mentioned FTP once or twice in there and that's <laughs> about it. Um, there's, there's a whole discussion you can have on getting that set up, um, you know, anything that I've got in there could have been expanded on very easily. Um, I was talking to someone shortly after the book first came out and, you know, they read through it and said, this is all great. And, and it looks like you left a lot on the table. And I, and I said, yeah, I could honestly have done twice as long. I could have gone twice as long as this. Um, and that was actually a, a discussion point with uh, my publisher originally is we had we had originally talked about okay let's let's top this out at about eighty thousand words, and I got about halfway through that and I was like, ah, how hard are we on eighty thousand? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I'm about halfway through that number and I've got maybe a quarter of what I was even hoping to touch on done here. So um, I don't know i stopped counting at eighty thousand. they didn't push back and, and edit too much out after that so i don't think i went too far over that um but yeah i easily could have done yeah, another book exactly the same size um in terms of of you know just elaborating on everything that's in there um you know from i i'm sure you know anybody who's read this can see yeah there's a lot of this is very high level, mm -hmm. uh, very superficial in some cases, because I just, I'm trying to cover so much ground in so little time. What, what this, so easily could have expanded this. I was going to say what, what this leads into is this looks like an ongoing series that you should be posting like every year. So it is what it is, but I think that <laughs> I'm, I'm talking with if we can get more out of this, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I, I really think you can, because honestly, like you said, no one's done this before. We we all have our own base knowledge uh, when it comes to web comics. What we've experienced, what we've loved, what we've hated, um, what's transitioned from a technological standpoint to from pen and paper to Wacom tablets to virtual reality. Eventually, you know, I could see a lot of this stuff sure. evolving, um, but that's just the tip of how created with their work. Um, the fact that we, we carry a torch for the old guard and, and the new ones coming into play for when it comes to webcomic creators is amazing in, in their own right. And I've met so sure. many people, and I'm sure you spoke with a whole bunch of people as well too, regarding this new generation, the ones that are truly technically savvy, the ones that don't rely on the old mediums that, that everyone else was used to. Yeah. Um, is there anyone that comes to mind that, you know, in five, 10 years, maybe in five years, let's say that, you know, this, this creator is going to go far. Um, or a couple of them doesn't have to be one. Yeah. yeah there's honestly, I was going to say, there's just, there's so many, I think there, you're going to see a lot of, I think there are a lot of folks like right on the cusp of it right now. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that I like to point out is uh, Raina Telgemeier who mm -hmm. does, you know, Smile and, and a lot of those other books. Smile originally was a webcomic. Yep. Most people don't remember that. Um, and that was one that, you know, Scholastic looked at and said, oh, hey, this is really cool. Let's publish this, right? I, I think there's going to be a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Um, 
and you're you're kind of already seeing it, right? Check please just came out um, whenever a year or two back. That was the same deal. Uh, Lumberjanes was another one, right? Um, Nimona. No, not well, yeah, it wasn't Lumberjanes. It was Nimona. Um, that was originally a web comic, and that was just her her like college thesis project or something, and and that got picked up. Um, I think there's, I'm trying to think of, uh, there are just so many people who are like right there, just getting picked up now, um, that are really phenomenal. And I, I question whether or not they're already inking deals <laughs> with various publishers in the background and, and just haven't been able to, to speak to them publicly yet. Um, uh, who else do I, there's, uh, Lo Brockoff, um, she does a variety of things. Blue Deliquati, uh, I'm probably not saying her last name correctly there. <laughs> uh, she does uh, uh, some really great stuff. Um, I know Tony Cliff has been getting some, he's kind of been picking up with uh, uh, a few of his books lately. He just got signed, I think a couple of years ago um, for, for his work. Um, and it, it ends up being a, the, the other question to have with that is how much, uh, how many of those successes are independent and remain independent and how many are getting picked up, mm -hmm. right? You, you've got folks like, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Jock uh, as a prime example, right? He's, he's doing phenomenal work by himself, yep. right? He's not, he's doing all self-publishing stuff. Um, he's he used to have, and I think I mentioned this in the book too, um, his Patreon um, used to publicly say, here's how much I'm, people are contributing to my Patreon every month, right? And, and before he turned that off, I think a year or two ago, he was pulling in, like, uh, I think it boiled down to, um, if I remember right, it was like $10,000 a month something like that, 10 or $12,000 a month, um, just through his Patreon, not including sales of anything, not including whatever, right? He's got no need to go to a Scholastic, to go to a, a Oni Press or a First Second or, or anybody like that. Um, so I think there's, it, there's gonna be a lot of creators kind of in that bucket who are finding a lot of success uh, creatively and then have the option to kind of dabble in and out of uh, of whatever they want to do. Um, Brian Clevenger is another good one, good example. Um, he's actually a, a really interesting example. I wish I could have included him in the book <laughs> going going back too, because he started off with the 8-bit uh, the theater stuff uh, as an online comic. That went really well. Uh, I think it was Red 5 Comics picked him up to publish this, you know, hey, whatever else you want to do. And so he did this atomic robo thing. Yep. Um, but that was as a print comic. And then that was successful enough. He's like, no, I don't even want to deal with the publisher. Let me bring it <laughs> back. And he started doing it as a web comic again, right? Nice. And I think there's a lot of interesting little dynamics like that um, that, that you're going to see. Um, and you're going to see more keep that, more types of people doing that type of thing. Another one, uh, Kathy and Stuart Eminent, Mm -hmm. um, you know, both of them longtime professionals in the print world, and they ran for, I want to say, three or four years. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the specific timeline. They're, they ran um, an online story called Grass, was it Grass of Parnassus, I think it is. Yeah. And I literally just like a day or two ago saw that that was solicited for July as a print piece. That's awesome. Um, you know, so I think there's, it's, it's going to be, a lot of everything. It's going to be. Um, it, I'll, 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 there's another good quote. I, I think I don't recall if I actually have this in the book or not. Um, Greg Cravens, who does a webcomic called Hubris, as well as a newspaper strip called The Buckets, um, he had a good bit. He was talking about, you know, uh, here's why I'm doing web comics and, and here's how I got into it on top of already having done newspaper comics. Um, and his bit is he, he had a nice little parenthetical. He's like all these kids doing new web comics or as you might call them today, comics, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and his point being that, you know, it's all just comics and 
you know that there's that there's a lot fuzzier line between web comics and newspaper comics and and print comics and digital comics and all of that kind of blurs together and as long as you're kind of working on that craft of making comics you can float between those pretty easily pretty readily and we've seen some of that to a degree with uh, some of those professional cartoonists you know mark wade stepped his uh had duck his had his toe in the water there for a while and and uh you know there's various other creators who, who who've done that and the problem has always been they were coming to the table creatively but not uh financially i guess is maybe the best word um you know not having not understanding how that the finances work on that which is different and i think that's that's one of the things i tried to highlight in the book is that you know the the act of creating comics is no different from one to the other um it's you have to work with a different business model and a different kind of financial mindset uh, in a lot of cases and i think that's that's a key part that a lot of people end up missing cool but yeah i mean it, you're going to see stuff coming in from from all forms, all forms i think you're going to see more print creators doing more web comics more web comics people doing print comics it's going to start bleeding together a lot more depending on what people want to do creative yeah no it's uh really enjoyable i've i'm always down for talking web comics and it's very few people are honestly interested in it so it's very refreshing if you had a movie title for your life what would it be oh geez that's a tough one um I would, you know what? I would just go with my last name, Kleefeld, and maybe not the most descriptive one, but it's uh, it'll stand out on the marquee because nothing else is going to be named anything like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> At least it won't be confused with Cloverfield. Totally different things. A totally different movie, and I hope a very different vibe overall too. <laughs> it's just... More of a comedy, not. A... Although, actually, now that you mentioned that, that might not translate. Yeah, but as as you mentioned that, it might not translate well when it uh, when it airs over in Germany. So. Oh, geez, what does it mean in German? <laughs> Cloverfield and Cloverfield are identical. Oh, That's uh, Kleefeld is German for Cloverfield. So it's <laughs> yeah. So I don't know that that would translate, but um, I might have to rethink on that. But but I'll stick with Kleefeld for the time being. Fair enough. Everyone had one or two people that kind of inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Um, I've got a, I'll give you a couple answers for that. Um, first one, um, just in a general, broadest sense, probably my father uh, picked up a lot of just uh, you know uh, life skills and and life. Uh, perspective uh, and that from him so uh, in, in the broadest sense uh, he would be probably my go-to um, in terms of my writing specifically particularly as it pertains to comics uh, there are three guys uh, I would point to um, Peter Sanderson and Will Murray and Greg Theakston um, all of whom were they've done a variety of things but uh, my introduction to all three of them was back in the the 80s when they were writing um they were they were basically doing all of the not exactly academic but uh very smart uh pop culture type of writing um peter sanderson in particular was uh for example he was the when they had this role that he was the archivist at marvel um and did a lot of work on the the marvel universe handbooks um, Will Murray, uh, he did a lot of research and has actually written a lot of Doc Savage novels and, and Shadow Pulps and that kind of thing. Um, but he did a lot of work in um, the fan press talking to older creators and, um, you know, getting interviews with, with folks that most were like almost dismissed in the comics press at the time um, and got in some really interesting detailed stuff. And Greg Thies, excuse me, Greg Thies then did as well. He had a lot of research and was able to get in some archives um, that very few people back, certainly back in the 80s, had seen at all. Uh, a lot of 
uh, really early, you know, 60s Kirby, uh, Jack Kirby stuff, um, Steve Ditko stuff, uh, that getting into what those people were doing. Um, and all three of them were basically like, at least as far as I could tell at the time, again, this is back in the 80s, um, the three of them were the only ones really doing anything like that. And the, the thought of being able to write intelligently about comics, um, not like from, a, not I, like I said, none of them were really academics per se, but they, they had this kind of academic approach in, in pop culture that, uh, that I hadn't seen at all at that time. Um, so a lot of, uh, a lot of what I've written, a lot of my writing style in terms of what I'm talking about in comics comes from the three of them. Is there a big difference between writing academically and being a, uh, being a critic? Um, I would, yeah, um, largely in terms of uh, how fancy your wording gets. <laughs> um, if you if you read through a lot of academic literature, it uh, it, it tends to have a uh, little there, there's a little higher bar you have to clear in terms of what your thesaurus looks like. Basically, um, you know, uh, when I'm when I'm writing for just my blog or, or something a little bit, uh, you know, just a little bit more. Uh, not quite so academic, I, should, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, is it, it tends to be a little bit more casual, a little bit more uh, uh, conversational. Um, you know, the so my sentence structure tends to, you know, uh, it's just a little, little less nuanced, a um, little bit more direct, a little bit more, uh, there's, you know, obviously a little bit more snark involved and, and jokes and a casualness involved in that yeah the academic stuff you, you can't be dropping uh, uh you know parentheticals about how much of an ass this one guy is or anything like that so uh definitely definitely a little bit of a difference there i mean you can but you know they're gonna know what words you're using so yeah that is true yeah yeah <laughs> From a professional standpoint, you've written many books, and in fact, you're now an Eisner-nominated author, which, as I said before, congratulations. From a personal perspective, do you consider yourself successful? Um, well, I suppose so, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm certainly, I've certainly done a a lot of things and and been able to get done a lot of things that I would never have dreamed I'd been able to do like when I was you know 12 13 14 15 um, so from that perspective if I if I try to look at it objectively like that yeah um, it's hard not to, to say that there's been a, a fair degree of success there um, that said, you know, I've also got the kind of perpetual nagging doubt of, I think, any sort of creator, any sort of creative person that you're not doing good enough. And, um, you know, it's, uh, there's always more that can be done. There's more that uh, I could be doing. Um, and that's always kind of sitting in the back of my head of, you know, hey, yeah, you're, you're doing pretty well now, but you could be doing better. Um, and um, I've actually got, uh, there was a, a Jack Kirby bust that came out a few years ago. And I've got that sitting right over my desk, kind of looking at me the entire time. Uh, and I like to keep it there as, as his way, uh, my way of, uh, of him looking back at me and saying, well, what else are you doing, Kirby, Sean? <laughs> you know, what, what else do you got doing? You know, I, I used to, you know, Jack Kirby used to draw you know, uh, like three comic books a month, like to start to finish, he would do the Avengers and then sit down and do the X-Men and then do the Fantastic Four and maybe Thor on top of that every month for, for years on end. Um, you know, that, that kind of work ethic is, uh, you know, there's one of the reasons why Kirby was, Jack Kirby was such an incredible powerhouse is just he could sit down and just crank stuff out all day, every day. Um, and you know, like I said, if, if I look at myself objectively, yes, there, there's, you know, no question. There's definitely some measure of success there, but there's still the, that kind of desire that's, 
that spark that says, yeah, you could be doing, you know, that that's, you've, you've gotten to this plateau, but there's another plateau up there you can still get to. Yeah, just don't think you're climbing Everest every single book you try to write, and I think it'll be manageable. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, the, I suppose the joke answer would be crying in the shower, a <laughs> thing like that. Um, but no, I mean, there's there's a there's an immediate uh, way to address that, and that's usually some kind of frustration and anger of okay, the, I, this didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, or I didn't get wasn't able to get this done, or, or whatever. Um, and there, there's an initial emotional kind of, for, at least for me, there's this initial emotional kind of just rage, for lack of a better term. Um, what I try to do with that, though, and is, is then channel that into moving on to something better and improving on whatever it is, you know. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to use that energy and push that into, you know, uh, the next, you know, the next blog post I'm writing, the next column I'm working on, the next, uh, the next time I go to the gym, you know, or, or go out for a run or something, is, is channel that energy into something as positive as I can. I don't like to rely on that. Um, I don't like to, you know, I think there's a danger there of if you soak yourself in that and you use that energy, that kind of negative energy to fuel yourself going forward, then that gets that kind of forces you into a bad place all the time and you end up kind of relying on that that negative energy, which I don't want to do. I try not to do that. But if there if that does come about that something really blew up in my face, you know, creatively or whatever, I do try to, to channel that into an, an improvement of some sort, right? You just can't sit there and stew in it uh, for a long period of time. You, you, you pick that up and Again, at least for me, I pick that up and I kind of try to run with that and you focus that energy into something that's uh, that that can be more positive than just kind of sitting there and stewing in in whatever negative juices you've got going on there. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative themselves, either as a writer or maybe a webcomic creator or whatever they'd like to do creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Um, I think it's about not forcing that inspiration, right? I'm not, if anybody is looking to me and or my work for any level of inspiration, that's fantastic, but that's not why I'm doing this, right? That's, that's I, I'm doing all this, you know, this book, the any the other work that I've done, whether that's in Jack Kirby Collector or or blog posts or whatever, it, you know, anything else that I've put out creatively, the only person I'm putting that out for is myself. Um, I'm one of the things I've, I've said before is the right my for me the writing is not the end product, the writing is the means to getting to the end product, which is the knowledge and research and all of that in the process. Then the, the writing is just my way of kind of focusing all of that interest, all of that energy, all of the research into a cohesive format that that's, ends up being linear. So I'm not out here writing, you know, I'm not writing, I didn't write web comics to sell a lot of books. I didn't write web comics to uh, inspire people necessarily to become web comic creators. That would be fantastic if that does, I, if that does happen. I, that would be fantastic if academics read this and start talking about web comics in the classrooms more. That would be fantastic if all the, uh, the comic news outlets read this and started talking about web comics more. I think there's a huge lack of, of information generally out there about it that i would love to see that happen but that's not why i did it i, I did it for myself um i you know what this is all 
me synthesizing and processing all of the information I can. The writing is just the means uh, to the end of that knowledge. Um, so I would say if somebody is looking to be an inspiration down the road, don't use that as the driving force, right? Use whatever it is that you've got that you're you're interested in in and of yourself what in what whatever you find interesting and creative and whatever it is that you're passionate about pursue that for its own end and if you're doing that to the best of your ability and you're passionate about it then you end up being that inspiration to other people but don't seek out the 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 desire don't don't seek out that spotlight for being an inspiration. Do the work for for your own self first, and then, you know, let the inspiration happen if it happens. Well, Thank you. Sean, I hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. But before I let you go, where can we find you online and on social media? Uh, easiest thing to do is just search on Sean Kleefeld. Just do a Google search on that and you will get nothing but me. <laughs> and the uh, benefit of my name is that it's it's pretty much unique. So um, you do a search on that, you'll find my Twitter, you'll find my Facebook, you'll find my website, you'll find my blog, you'll find copies of my book somewhere. Um, that's just... Just Google for me and you'll you'll get whatever outlet that you, you want to try and engage me with. Well, Sean, thanks so much for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. Uh, I can't wait to personally buy a physical copy of that book. I think it's going to look great behind me there. And, uh, you know, showcase it to the world. I hope you will be for, for your uh, academic work there. It was a, a, a great read. It's uh, full of Thank knowledge, you. whether you are into web comics or whether you think you're not. Um, I really think that it's a great book that should be used in the classroom as a as a wonderful guide as well, too. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I had a fantastic time talking to you. So I, I really appreciate the, the best hour or whatever it's been. As I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can find this interview as well as thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com geekstalking.com that's the word two not the number two you can of course find our youtube channel interviews as well youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgt media and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking hey all kurt sasso here from two geeks talking if you like this video and these quick clips here make sure you take a look at our youtube channel youtube.com forward slash tgt media make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well hit the bell to make sure you get notifications of course from videos like this here uh thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented creative people in the entertainment industry i'm your host kurt sasso thank you so much